Welcome back, and we are moving into our second conversation for today. We're joined by Diana Shaw, who is an attorney and also the founder of the Child Development Foundation. Good morning, Diana. Good morning. It's so good to be here. Oh, it's good we to are have you. very <laughs> grateful to have you and uh, very eager to uh, have your insight on on this particular topic. We're talking about or we're giving advice to parents yes. as to what they can do, what they need to pay attention to to protect their children from predators. Yes. And I know this is uh, one of the primary objectives yes. of the Child Development Foundation. So yes. let's start there with the work you do. Yeah. So yes, at CDF, uh, Child Development Foundation, we are very concerned about eradicating child sexual abuse, human trafficking, and commercial sexual exploitation of children. Yeah. And as you know, in Belize, this is an endemic problem. It's something that we have been dealing with for many, many years now. Actually, tomorrow will be 19 years since I came to Belize. Wow. Tomorrow is my 19th anniversary wow. of the day I landed in Belize. And <laughs> drink the water. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And very early on when I came here, I originally came here with the intention to be here for one year, mm -hmm. practicing law. But I started doing some work at Central Assemblies of God Church, where I was then at the time volunteering in the community, mm -hmm. and became very aware of the vulnerability of children and some things that children were going through in our communities. And also the pressure that was on parents. Mm -hmm. And Belize is not different from the other Caribbean countries, the same dynamics exists in other Caribbean countries. The challenge for Belize is that the population is so much smaller. Mm -hmm. So everything gets magnified a lot more and the impact of it is felt a lot more because everybody's connected. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when it happens to one person, it's not just that one person, it's their family and by extension, the other persons that are connected to the family that are impacted. Oh, look. This is what we found. And look at that, 19 years in Belize. And next and month, uh, 10 years officially since we have incorporated. The Child Development the Foundation. Foundation. That lots is to celebrate. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Definitely a lot to celebrate. It is. Yeah. Now, I, I want to I wanna ask what, what an important a question that has, uh, I've always uh, felt that we don't discuss enough, which is what do we know statistically, data-based, evidence, to say how big this problem is in this country? Yeah. Statistically, what we know is that the reporting of sexual abuse is a main abuse that's reported now. Mm -hmm. Years ago, it used to be physical abuse. We have a lot of cases now of sexual abuse being reported. We do know that the estimates are that about one in every five child, every one in every five child in Belize is exposed to some aspects of sexual exploitation or abuse. Mm. Wow. So it's very rampant. It follows very close with domestic violence statistics. Sexual abuse, when it happens within the family, is a form of domestic violence. Yep. And what we also know in Belize is that most of the cases, more than three quarters of the cases, happen within the context of the family. Mm. So it's improper contact with somebody who has a caregiving responsibility for the child. It could be a father, stepfather, aunt, uncle, because it's not just male perpetrators anymore. We have female perpetrators as well. So let me, let me break down these numbers. One in every five children in Belize have exposed. most likely yeah. been exposed to some kind of sexual violence. Yes. And, and can we translate that to adults, that one in every five adults would have had that experience? Yes, exactly. So that this is what we are finding. We are now having... This is the second gen or third generation in some cases mm -hmm. of abuse happening and this further erodes the ability of communities and especially families to handle this issue. Because mm -hmm. when you are a parent who was sexually abused, if you did not get intervention, if you didn't receive counseling, it lowers your parenting capacity to be able to address the issue. It sometimes it causes you to normalize it or to accept that it is inevitable. Mm -hmm. And when you see red flags, you may not act as quickly to address it. And in some cases, it also causes fear because sometimes it's the same perpetrator. We have had cases where we had a grandfather who abused his daughter, his granddaughter, and then his great-granddaughter. So it's sometimes, when it's in that family context, it's very hard to deal with it because then there is a whole, everybody wants to protect the family image. They, they want to silence the person who is speaking out, the victim, mm -hmm. because they don't want to admit that it happened to them because of what that will mean for how people will treat them and stigma and a lot of those things. So in the family, where families are very close or isolated, you see a lot of those dynamics where it's generational 
and nothing is happening and when somebody finally speak out and you start to investigate the family dynamics mm -hmm. you find out that this was happening for quite some time to somebody else in the family and nothing was done from the 20 percent of the population you would say who, who've most likely experienced some form of sexual abuse only one quarter one out of four report yes so, so what we, we are seeing and hearing reporting. in the news that's is just only the tip of the iceberg yeah. what we are seeing as heinous as it is mm -hmm. and as blatant as it is and it, uh, the shock value of it is also important and we really are grateful to the media for highlighting this because yes. were it not for these media reports some of this would never ever hit daylight because most families do not self-report so so diana you know after that amount you know the amount of years you're here in belize and the, the 10 years that you I, i've got to say congratulations actually and the 10 years that you've been uh, going over this what do you think is going on? Wh what have you sat down with one of these these these, these perpetrators and and, 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 and and try to find out what's going on in, in mentally with that? Because it's alarming. One of every four would report, and like you mentioned, what we hear in the media is just a scratch of the of the globe of, of what's going on. Talk to us about the mindset of somebody who have prob who have done this. Yeah. What's going on there? It's a very complicated, multifaceted problem. Mm. It's, there isn't a one specific profile of perpetrators. We do find that there are some things that have indicated a higher propensity. So, for instance, drug and alcohol use is a very big red flag. Mm. In a lot of the cases with sexual abuse, there is the perpetrator was somebody who habitually abused drugs or alcohol. So they usually, come home drunk and do something. Yes, mm -hmm. and it usually happened when they were drunk, when they were, they, what, it's not the, the fact that they drank that caused it. What happened is that they were probably thinking about doing this before, mm -hmm. but drinking reduces your inhibition, mm -hmm. so it allows the real you to show up. It allows whatever you were in your conscious mind would have been suppressing mm -hmm. to come out. So if they had these thoughts before, once they are drunk, they would no longer be able to suppress it, so mm -hmm. they would more likely act on it. So we do see that that has shown up, that we do have a lot of men in our community that have this propensity or have this desire to have sexual relationships with children. So we have a lot of pedophiles. This is something that we have been very slow to address because it's a taboo kind of thing and it, it is uh, shameful and it should be. But until we grapple with that, the interventions won't be successful because while we are working a lot with victims and providing rehabilitation and recovery and even some prevention to give children advice about what to look for, the bigger problem is the perpetrator. Mm -hmm. And course. we do need to address the perpetrator tendencies and Belize has a large population of perpetrators. Are we... How I'm still stuck on the one in every five what, uh, yeah. ch pr child. Um, but you're right. Uh, we, we need to, at times, and we focus so much on telling victims how to pr protect themselves instead of spotting the perpetrator mm -hmm. and sometimes stemming behavior very yes. early. Uh, but when you look at Belize versus the global perspective, are we just like everybody else? Is the problem we're facing here similar to what's in the rest of the Caribbean or Central America? Is it a cultural thing? Some parts of it, some aspects of it is cultural, mm -hmm. but in terms of the incidents, the problem is similar to other mm -hmm. parts of the Caribbean. Belize doesn't stand out in the data except when we compare population size. Okay. So because, again, the population of Belize is relatively small mm -hmm. compared to some of our neighbors, when you look at the per capita rates, then yes, it is, it's oh. Belize starts to stand out that this is a little bit more prevalent because the population is so smaller. much smaller. And also what we see is that we have lower conviction rates. <laughs> so we have more, the, the, in terms of the, because of the size of the population, the per capita incidence would seem, the prevalence would seem higher. And also because of less conviction rate, it seems that the response is not as strong. And there's, because of that now, then there is this idea that it is more tolerated or the, the, the culture or the society is less quick to act on it when it happens. Mm -hmm. You rarely hear incidents in Belize of communities rising up in arms and, you know, 
getting a perpetrator and taking them to the police, where you do hear a lot of that in some other countries. So it, it stems that we have a different issue how it happens here, as I said before, because a lot of it happens within the context of family, and yeah. our families are so interconnected, people are unwilling to report on family members. They mm -hmm. would be more willing to report if it was a stranger. Mm -hmm. So with the cases where we have had with foreigners, there's a lot of reporting, and people, they protest, and they are angry, but if it's somebody in their family, they would not do that. They would be out on the street protesting and they would be taking the person to the police because the family connectedness impedes some of the response. And a pedophile by nature, if instinctively they uh, assault children, um, if they're not stopped, they'll continue. They will continue. This is a very, it's something that has a very, very low rehabilitation rate. So there are some programs in some countries across the world where they have tried rehabilitation, but the success rate is very, very low. Wow. The likelihood is that once somebody has broken that barrier from just thinking about it mm -hmm. to actually act on it, it's very hard for them to go back to put that back to where it was before <laughs> because there is a whole power dynamic that has shifted mm -hmm. that they would want to repeat the behavior to experience that. It's like an addiction. But it is not an addiction because it's a conscious choice that somebody is making that this is how they want to interact with children. And so because of that, persons who are interacting with adults, the other adults, the parents, need to be vigilant about who they bring in contact with their children. Mm -hmm. And this is the part where I think as a culture, we're very slow to get this. Even though we have had so much campaigns with public awareness, we still find parents who still honestly believe this can't happen to them. They, yeah. They're still in denial. There are two things that I'm hearing from the conversation that I want to extract. One, when a victim does not ever disclose to anyone that they were molested or abused or raped or repeatedly raped and molested and grow into adulthood, it increases the likelihood for their children to be exposed. That, that, that's what you it, said? Yes, it makes them less willing to protect or less able to protect their children. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it, it's this idea of victimology. It mm -hmm. creates this idea that they are powerless to address oh. their circumstance or they feel that they, what they feel blamed sometimes for what happened to them. So, you know, I didn't do anything when that happened to me. So this must be why this is happening. It was, or it happens it, to all it children. It happens to all children. There, sometimes there's some of that. And this is why the, the counseling intervention is so important because counseling actually helps to break that victimology to, to help them to realize that it was the perpetrator who was at fault. And so because the blame can cause them to be less protective about those that mm -hmm. it should be. Secondly, when a perpetrator is never identified, and I don't mean media identified, I mean uh, I was a victim, I never told anyone, he continues, he or she continues to do whatever they're doing yes. um, repeatedly, yes. even though I know I don't tell anyone. So I don't warn my aunt who has young children or his wife or who's having sister. children or my sister. Yes. And so this unnamed person, person is able to just continue yep. wrecking people's lives. Yes. So a lot of what we do, especially when we work in schools, is about empowering young people to speak out. Mm -hmm. That even if it's something that happened a long time ago, you need to tell somebody because you want to start to create that kind of accountability that we help people to understand that perpetrators are in our community. We, they, we have a false idea that perpetrators are people who are coming to our community. It's foreigners and strangers who are coming. That is rarely the case. Mm -hmm. Most of the perpetrators already live Lives. in our community. And, and, in we need, and in your family. And we need to be aware of them so that we can protect children from them. And this is where we need to get to. So, so, so Diana, um, in today's day and age, you know, we, we're seeing a lot of things. And, you know, it's sick to the stomach, the, you know, the things that's going on right now. But we talk about it, but one of the things we need to do is to help people to identify or recognize when things are not going on the way it, it should, should in the home. Yes. So what are the steps we should take to, to, to recognize this? Uh, you know, the, the, that person seems or the child seems a little... What? But, yeah. So we normally say, so there are definitely some things that are a red flag. For instance, somebody who always wants to be alone with a specific child. Uh, yeah. Somebody, if it's even your uncle, your grandfather, there's one child in the family, 
that they give an, an unreasonable amount of attention so that it makes you uncomfortable. We say to people that sexual abuse and a perpetrator is something that you feel. It's an instinctive feeling because you know that this person's contact with this child seems improper. They touch the child a little bit too much. The things that they are saying to the child, they may use overtly sexy things to the child. Oh, your bottom so fat and sexy. Mm. And they say it in such a way that, you know, it would something you would it say to an adult. It yeah. makes you uncomfortable. If there's somebody in your family that's doing that, that's somebody that you need to watch out for. Don't laugh at it and say, oh, I'm only when he's drunk and talk foolishness like that. When he's drunk, it's his real personality coming mm. out. So this is probably something he has been thinking about, something that he has been dreaming about. The other red flag is if they have child pornography. If somebody has um, pornographic images of children on their phone or on their laptop and, or any picture of naked children and you come across that, that is a definite red flag. Because if they're sitting down masturbating to pictures of children, they will act on that. Because that is something that's going to push and feed that drive that they have. Mm -hmm. So if you see that, that's a red flag. Any woman that's in a relationship with any man that has any kind of pornographic images of children, break that relationship and get out. That is your child is a target. Mm -hmm. That is a definite red flag. That's it. If their person is comfortable watching pornography with children around, they want to put on pornographic movies and bring in the child to watch it when they are watching it. That's also a red flag. They are normalizing sexual interaction with children. So you need to be aware of that. If you see your spouse doing that, tell them you don't want them to do that. And if they insist on doing that or the child comes and tells you, Daddy, want me to watch um, this movie with him and I never like it because naked people in it and he was saying, oh, it's so much fun. That's a red flag. Act on those things mm -hmm. when you see that. What if about you, grooming? Uh, they groom. Uh, that's the, that's part of the grooming. The, usually, they will start out a lot with just talk, you saying things that may seem inappropriate, using sexual language to the, the, the child to get the child excited about talking to them or to have the child feel that they're adult and that they're their equal. You could break so rules that with they me. They could break rules with me. So, um, they may introduce alcohol, give the child alcohol to drink. You know, your mommy don't want you to drink alcohol, but you know, when you're with uncle, uncle cool, make you yeah. do anything where you want. So yeah. uncle, we give you a little alcohol because alcohol will make you feel nice. Somebody that's saying something like that, that's grooming behavior, right? That is not normal behavior for an adult to want a 12, 13 year old to sit down and be their drinking buddy. Mm -hmm. There's something that they're doing that for. So when you see that, don't ignore it and say, oh, I must be lonely, I want a friend. No, he needs to go and find a friend his age. <laughs> that's not something you do with a child. That's a grooming behavior. They are trying to mm -hmm. break down some barrier or boundary with the child because they want some reason for that. What is the reason they want? They want to have some kind of inappropriate contact with that child. So you need to watch out for that. Somebody who is buying inappropriate gifts for children, buying lingerie for your 12-year-old daughter. What? Or, or expensive, or expensive um, jewelry for your 12-year-old daughter. And, oh, she's so bright and she's so special. I want to give her this and it's just from uncle. No, don't take that gift mm. because they, that will create an obligation on the part of the child. A lot of times they do that to create obligation. That, you know, I give you so much gifts and uncle just trying to be nice, man. Just give uncle a little kiss. That's grooming behavior. So when you see that as a parent and you are uncomfortable with that, stop it in the bud. We mm -hmm. say to parents all the time, when your gut is telling you that something is not right, trust your gut. Mm -hmm. Don't ignore it. Because a lot of times we do ignore it and say, oh, I'm just being sensitive. He's just trying to be nice. He's a kind person. He or does you don't want to upset the family. I don't want to upset him. Hear people, yeah. Yes, people have told me that. I didn't say anything because my mother would have been upset if I told her that I felt that my grandfather was saying something inappropriate to our child. No, they need to be offended. They, your child needs to be protected. Mm. The greater responsibility is the protection of the child, and we need to think less about not offending people. Can, can you know, in, in your line of work, uh, you know this, a lot of Belizean families just have this as one big family secret, yes. where people inside know, like, oh, don't go to that uncle. Yes. But it's almost like hush-hush, and yes. they don't address, address the problem, problem in the room. Yeah. Yep. So what does that do if i if, if we're in a family we're like eh, you know grandpa my mom is saying i go to grandpa or to uncle or to auntie mm -hmm. whoever it is mm -hmm. um and we just kind of have that conversation taking place behind closed doors uh but not really belling the cat is that a form of protection because people no, feel that it is it is not it is yeah. not actually it is actually the worst thing you can do because one what it does is that it creates this sense of forbiddenness for the child Oh, because some, a lot of times they don't tell them why. 
they yeah. will just say to them, don't go over to your grandfather's house. If, if grandmother if grandma not there, don't go in there. And if I don't carry you, don't go by yourself. Mm -hmm. But they don't tell them, grandpa like to touch children inappropriately and I don't want you to, him to touch you. They don't say that. So the child doesn't know what is the real reason wow. why they shouldn't go there. So they, they have this sense of forbiddenness. Oh, grandma, mommy must just not like grandpa. Look how grandpa kind. If we go there, we'll give you a biscuit. So they will want to break that rule because now you have set up this forbidden thing and children are like that. Once you set up a forbidden boundary, they want to push it. Mm. So you need to explain to them, grandpa sometimes does things to children that mommy does not like and grandpa does not, mommy doesn't want grandpa to touch you in any way that will make you uncomfortable. So do not go there without mommy. They need to know why they need to avoid grandpa and a lot of times we don't do that. So that creates that and then the other thing that it does is that it creates a sense of impunity in the perpetrator that nobody will speak out that they will be shielded and so therefore this set of people this pool of children is their territory mm. so they will begin to feel that within this pool of children if they have an opportunity to one of the children they should take it because nobody will speak out whereas if you bring expose it and bring accountability it creates a sense of deterrence because yeah. now they know that they will be confronted yeah. so <coughs> this is why families should not be silent about this if you know that there's somebody in your family that has had inappropriate contact with children you need to confront it you need to tell them I that you're not okay with it looking at our under reporting rate mm -hmm. this is what concerns me so there's family and if it's in the family which most cases it, it is, is or someone close to the family that knows and there's a wider community sometimes that knows. Yes. But we don't say anything, not even to the woman who gets into a relationship with that man that we knew exactly. used Mr. to Abuse rape a child. child. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or rape his wife, a wife even. Yes. This is where we need to change that. Because this culture of silence is putting our children and our women at risk. It's killing us. And we need to change that. If you know that somebody was a perpetrator, them getting married is not going to cure their perpetrator yeah. tendencies. So if you see them dating somebody, you need to say to that person, even if they don't believe you, even if they don't accept it, you still need to say it. That person, I, when we were growing up, he did some things to us that we never liked. He mm -hmm. used to try to force us to touch him or to force us to try to kiss him and do stuff with him. Just be careful with your child. But you need to say that. Some parents, you know, especially following conversation like this one, very strong, mm -hmm. would tell you, see, this is the reason why I don't like to talk about sex and touch and, and, and body parts in my house because this stems, this actually pushed the situation uh, uh, mo much more because my child wants to be curious now and find out what this is. So that's why I don't want to talk about this stuff. What will you say to these people? I would say you're dead wrong because it's quite the opposite. The more information children have about what abuse is, the more they can see a perpetrator who is trying to groom them and it sends off red flags that they will say to this person, no, it's okay. And they will move and they will more, be more likely to come to you as a parent or to, to their teacher or another adult to say something. When children are ignorant, the perpetrator usually is a far away, usually results in sexual activity before the child realizes that something is wrong. Mm -hmm. But when you inform them from the time the person starts to say something to them or try to touch them, they say, no, that, they're not supposed Mommy to do that. Mommy said that wrong. Yes, mm -hmm. you're yeah. not supposed to do that. So then they, are, they can set boundaries. But if they don't know that, they don't, don't know when to tell the person that this is, they're uncomfortable with this and when they should report it. They will know that the sexual activity should not happen. So usually in those cases, it's when it reaches sexual intercourse mm -hmm. that the child will then say something. Because they get hurt. Because yeah, they get hurt. Then the, child just, say, yeah. the, then the child would say, um, because, and we discussed this so many times, and this is the reason why this forum is so important. Um, Parents actually send their child to, 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 to hug yes. her because that's your elder. The child would say, you know what, I can't say anything because he's older than I am. That's my elder and I have to respect my elder. And that's the move he's actually making. What do you say about can I Can I add something? Because that's, that's one of the points I want to get at. There are small behaviors that parents do very innocently. Mm -hmm. yes. They're not trying to harm their children. I have a core belief that no parent wants this no, to happen to their child. No. But Telling my child, my little girl or my little boy, you must go hug that lady, you must go kiss her every time he or she resists is one behavior. The second one is, is not teaching children the proper name for their genitals. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people don't realize that this is dangerous yes. for sexual abuse. <laughs> Can you explain these? Yes. We see, especially with young children, and you see now that perpetrators are targeting younger children. And part of why they target younger children is the ignorance. Mm -hmm. They know that older children 
will more likely have heard something about this in school. So they're going to be more vigilant. They're going to be more guarded. They're going to set stronger boundaries. Mm -hmm. yeah. So usually with older children, they have to bribe them or give them gifts or they have to go through the parents to get access to older children. With younger children, they prey on their lack of knowledge. They yeah. prey on their ignorance. The fact that they don't know body parts so they can make it a game. And they will call it something else, and the child won't feel uncomfortable yeah. because they don't know that so this I is something. My it's your cookie. Yes. Let's use that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So the child don't feel uncomfortable until they actually experience pain, until they actually feel they're being penetrated or something like that. Then the child feels that, oh, this is wrong. So we have to teach them the appropriate good touch, bad touch, and use appropriate names so that they know when they talk about private areas, what they're talking about. Um, this is your part of your body that nobody's supposed yeah. to touch. You're, you are the person that have control over that. Don't allow anybody to say anything about your private areas. Come and tell mommy. Those things we have to get to young, young children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Two, three-year-old. As, as they should soon be saying the proper name. Yes, as they are old enough to speak, they need to know. They need to know that so that perpetrators won't use their ignorance against them. Mm -hmm. And we also have parents who don't speak to their children about any, not just the names, but they don't give their children any information about their body, about adolescent development. So we have young children that are vulnerable. And then the second age that children are vulnerable is at puberty. So perpetrators who target older children target children at the brink of puberty. They mm -hmm. look for girls that are just budding or, you know, they're just the body just changing because that's the second time of development that there is ignorance. They don't understand what's going on in their body. What's they, they, they have hormones now that are going off in their body. And the hormones will, once you have hormones, you're going to have some kind of sexual interest. But they don't, the child doesn't understand what that means. So yeah. the perpetrator exploits the ignorance of the child about managing their bodies, understanding adolescent development, and then tries to lure them into something. So you, we, well, what of what we do now, the RISE program we're doing in schools, we're working with schools to provide age-appropriate information to girls about adolescent development yeah. because they need to know body control they need to know body boundaries and they need to know that perpetrators do target adolescent girls this is not a if or maybe it's they do so those are the two most vulnerable groups that yes you spoke we, we of. see the younger age group and then that puberty yeah. that, that puberty group and the issue of forcing people forcing children to hug or interact with someone they don't want yeah. to is a boundary issue too. yes well we need to teach children as as a, as soon as they can speak you need to teach them boundaries. They set boundaries with their voice. Stop. No, I don't want to do that. And they set boundaries with their bodies by saying, I don't want to hug that person, mommy. I don't feel like hugging them today. And you have to be okay with that yeah. because they are learning independence and learning that they can, they have the right to control their body and they have the right to, to say that somebody should not touch them. If you don't teach them that, then sometimes it's confusing for them when a person who has authority over them, so they understand mm -hmm. when it's a stranger that the stranger should not force them. But if it's somebody who has authority over them, like an aunt or an uncle, is trying to touch their bodies, then they're sometimes they're confused about whether this person have a right to do that. They, know, they will usually won't speak up until the person actually hurts, hurts them, them because then they know that they're not supposed to do that. Yeah. But you want to prevent it before it gets even to that. Yeah. So you teach them body control. You teach them the fact that their body belongs to them. It doesn't belong to anybody else. Body ownership is very important so that they understand that from a young age and they can help to set those boundaries because the, the truth is we have so many perpetrators that we don't know. Even if you say that you have protected everybody in your house and you have vetted everybody that comes to your house your child can go to preschool your child can go to school your child can walk down the street and come in contact with a perpetrator wow. so you cannot be ignorant and think that you can create a bubble where your child can live free of any potential of being abused yeah. what you need to do is to build your child's capacity to uh, understand and to identify a potential perpetrator and to know what to do and then secondly if something does happen to the child to have a strong rehabilitation backup plan to help the child to recover from that can i ask a question why is it hard for people to believe children I is, don't do we know. still have that problem? I, we do, and it, it baffles me. I say, I, I question that myself because my experience, 19 years now working with children, is that most of the times children are telling the truth. They actually tell the truth a lot more than adults. Yeah. Most of the times, when, if you compare um, children and adults as to who will tell the truth more consistently, it's a child. The adult is usually much more able to lie consistently than a child. So I don't know why we have this false sense that children should not be believed. 
and why we still keep up to that because even our court system still keeps up to that because we still require children's evidence to be corroborated mm -hmm. in sexual offenses um, so we have not moved away from that in our legal system even though some of our Caribbean counterparts have and have changed their laws accordingly um, but in our culture as well so it's sometimes children will tell us that they told their parent mm -hmm. and the parent didn't believe them so now we have to tell children you have to keep talking until somebody listens so if your mother don't believe you <laughs> Go and tell your, your teacher. And if a teacher don't believe you, tell your pastor. And if a pastor don't believe you, tell somebody in your community. Tell your auntie. It shouldn't be that way. It should be that the first person that the child tells should, should believe be. and should respond. But we have such difficulty. And it is, it's not only in Belize. But again, as I say, because all of our abuse, almost all of it is connected, a lot of that has to do with denial. Because it's a family it's friend a family. or a so family it don't, It's not that we don't believe the child, it's that we don't, we don't want to. We don't want to believe it about the perpetrator. We don't want to be, right. So but, you know, I, and I think, I, think, mm -hmm. I think one of the reasons for that is because as adults, what we do is that we actually look at our children as, as our property mm -hmm. rather than an independent body who is actually honest. And they're, they're, they're so honest, they're so, they're, you know, they're so pure. And I would think this is one of the reasons why, if, even if a child is out there telling you the truth, you are heavily reluctant to believe because you feel that, you know what, it's when I say and not when you say. Yeah, that does feed into it. And a part of it is that I say to parents, your responsibility is not to be an investigator to find out really if your child is a liar or not because everybody tells lies. Mm. What you need to do is that you need to act responsibly. And the responsible thing to do is to check out what your child has said, not to deny it and not take any action because you already said the child is a liar. You have to take it at face value and act on it. And what does and, that mean? What does that act means, on it mean? Act on it means you need to report it. You need Go to report to the, to the Department of Human Services. You need to report to the police. And you may need to confront the person that this was done something to your child to let them know you're not going to allow them to have any further contact with the child, especially if it's somebody that you're living in close quarters with. That is important for the child to feel safe. And you also sometimes have to go to the hospital as yes. well. Yes, and I'll yeah. do a medical check. If yeah. Once you report to the police or to the Department of Human Services, they will go to do a medical check. In some cases, they can't because the incident happened a long time ago and injuries yeah. may have healed. But they still have to check to see if the child has contracted any STDs. We have young children in Belize who have herpes, who have contracted um, STIs um, from sexual abuse. They didn't get that from somebody coughing on them. So they, we, we cannot be in denial that this is happening. This is happening in our community. It is happening in our families. And we need to confront the issue where it is in our families. Can we swing this conversation? And I, and I, and I know there are many people who on the outside watch and say, oh, we're always attacking men. You know, it's, it's, it's ha women do it too. Boys get abused too. What are our ratios that we're talking about? What are we looking at? Boys are getting abused. Yes. Um, the by numbers, men or women? Or by, by both? By both. By okay. both men and women. And the number of reported cases are rising mm -hmm. um, with awareness. Be, people are reporting more. So we don't know yet if it's actually happening more or if because of the awareness there's more reporting. Okay. Mm -hmm. But definitely the number of reported cases with boys are increasing. So we're not uh, only teaching girls how to protect no, themselves. We it's have to boys. teach boys, boys. Yes. too. Yes, yes. And this is perhaps the more difficult part of it because in many communities, it's much easier to spot a male perpetrator who targets girls than it is to spot a male perpetrator who is targeting boys. Sometimes that's more difficult to spot. Um, there is more clandestine connection to that. In a, some of the cases, we see family involvement. Some, some of that is actually more like um, CSEC, commercial sexual exploitation where families are giving their children to men because they are providing money yeah. to the family, uh, providing food. We have cases with um, men who are paying rent or who are providing food for family members, and then the mothers have actually allowed the men to have sexual contact with their boys. That has happened. Mm -hmm. And some of the cases that we are seeing also involve older boys, 17, 18 year olds who are targeting younger boys. So we have some 17 year olds targeting eight or nine year old boys um, for sexual activity. So there is a deeper issue that's happening in the community as it relates to that, the need to provide appropriate sexual reproductive information. Yeah. 
And that, that's what, that was one of the points I wanted us, and we're, so, we're quickly running out of time here. And so, you know, we don't talk about the perpetrators. We don't talk about, and I don't know if there is enough to know what goes wrong in their own development process. Uh, is it just something, I mean, what is the science or evidence saying? Are we teaching people to not respect children, not respect women, not respect girls? Are we over-sexualized as a society? Are we repressed? Is it, I mean, what do we know? So some of it is a combination of that. Belize has not done a lot of studies on that. There are some in studies that have been done in Latin America and some in the Caribbean. Most of that has been done in the U.S. Belize has not done much studies on that uh, perpetrator behavior. What we do know is that perpetrator behavior starts very early. Um, there's tendencies that are shown usually from preteen, teenage years, they start to pick it up. Uh, a boy who's very forceful with girls wants to force them to touch him, doesn't respect boundaries of other people's bodies. Um, when you see that happening, that's, you need to take that child into counseling because you need to try to figure out what's going on behind that. Mm -hmm. We have seen some boys who were abused become abusers, but it is not um, any hard and fast that if you were abused, you become an abuser. That is actually, the science doesn't really show that. What it shows is that it makes you less likely to protect others. Okay. But we do know that you can see it sometimes from teenage years. You usually wow. start seeing it from preteen teenagers, so they're interacting with girls or with other boys. And that's when you need to get them counseling. Um, it's a psychological issue. It starts out as a psychological issue before they act on it. So you have to get them help to, and then to manage that and to, to learn to, to address that before they act on it. Because they, they do have the thoughts before they act on it. And then we also need to know that parenting, the, the huge problem that we're having in Belize is that we have such a huge parenting gap. We just don't have good parenting capacity that yeah. parents just don't think about the safety and the protection of their children as much as they should. And sometimes they put their children in unsafe situations because they don't know that the situation is unsafe or sometimes because they don't care. So we do need to close the parenting gap. I know NCFC has now developed the parenting, parenting manual, manual and they are now um, going to be recruiting people to roll it out, to teach that across the country so that we can close some of those gaps. Because we have a lot of young parents who never learned any of this at home. So they don't have that capacity. Yeah. So yeah. they will make a lot of mistakes about the kind of relationships that they get into, the kind of men that they're bringing with their children, yeah. and the things that they tell their children may not be appropriate. So my we have to close those gaps. My final question, Diana, of, for the three quarters of the people out there who have been abused and have never said anything or done anything about it, what's your advice to them? Talk to somebody. It doesn't matter when it happened. It doesn't matter if the person who did it is alive or dead. You need to talk about it because there is a part of your healing that cannot begin until you have talked about it. And you may be functioning and be holding down a job and you know, feel that everything is okay. But if you look at your life closely, you will see that it is impacting your relationships and sometimes your parenting. So it's very important that you get help because you really cannot give people what you don't have. And when somebody was abused, they lost something. It, it takes something from you that you need to get repaired, you need to get restored before you can be able to be the kind of parent that you need to be, the kind of wife that you need to be, the kind of um, friend that you need to be, the kind of person that you need to be. So talk about it. Get yeah. counseling help. Don't think that because you're now an adult and it happened when you were five, you should just try and forget it because you already tried it and mm -hmm. you already know that that doesn't work. So get help. Get right. Right. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank oh. you for having and, me. And uh, how do people contact you if they want to get involved in some of your programs? So for CDF, you can reach us on Facebook. We have a um, Facebook page, CDF Belize, or by phone, 615-7010, or by email, cdfbelize at ymail.com. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bro. We're going to go ahead and take a break when we come back. It's for the new business spotlight, and we're talking about New Jerusalem Shea Butter Products. So stay tuned.